Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Hello. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Is that better? Good morning and welcome to the forum. Nice of you all to come and hear and see uh, pictures from our trip to Europe this summer. Um, I won't show you all 2,500 pictures that are such a um, continuing education is so important for church leaders, often referred to as sharpening the saw. It's refreshing and rejuvenating for musicians to delve deeply into the origins of their instrument, and for me, that is the organ. This kind of study informs my playing, the selections of music I choose to offer in worship, and helps me grow in my craft. This past August, uh, let me see, <laughs> this past August and early September, I joined the organ builders from the Fritz shop on an organ study uh, trip to the Netherlands and North Germany. For me, the takeaway from the trip was an incredible opportunity to hear and experience music of the organs that composers were writing their music for originally in spaces where that music was first experienced by congregations. The organ builders were studying a specific kind of instrument from the Renaissance that was tuned in a particular system called mean tone for an upcoming project. The group was made up of organ builders from the United States and the Netherlands. Um, two organ professors, one from Eastman School of Music, who was my college professor at Oberlin, and the other from the North Netherlands Organ Academy, who I studied with on my sabbatical in 2018, plus organists and their partners and spouses. Uh, our group of 12 would see 32 plus organs during the 16 day trip and have the opportunity to live with many of these instruments for as much as a three to four hour visit. Bruce prepared the route and made all the arrangements to see some very significant historical organs. After the first day in the Netherlands, we traveled to Germany driving as far east as Magdeburg. So we started over there, came across here, before we turn north to Tangermunda and all the way up to Stralsund on the Baltic Sea. Um, there's a large concentration of historic organs here and in um, Province Groningen in the north. Thank you, guest Jesse, for getting us on. <laughs> After visits to organs in uh, Stralsund and Lübeck and Hamburg, um, and Norden, uh, nine days into the trip, we finally spent the two nights in the same hotel. We got pretty good at loading our luggage each, each night. We had four cars for 12 people. Uh, there's a huge concentration of historic organs in Ostfriesland in this area. Uh, sorry, this area. There's Norden. There it is, there it is, sorry. There's Ostfriesland. And then in Province Groningen in the north here. Um, we spent three nights in uh, Groningen and uh, made day trips out to small villages to see instruments. Our trip concluded with visits to an instrument in Osthausen and a visit to the uh, Flundrop organ shop in Zondam and then uh, back to um, Amsterdam. Uh, the Flintrop shop built the large organ at St. Mark's Cathedral in Seattle in 1965. So if you've ever been there for a program, um, that's uh, where it came from, right there. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, a typical organ visit uh, included being welcomed by the organist or another designated person with whom Bruce had coordinated our visit, who introduced us to the organ and its history, as well as the history of the church and sometimes the town or the area. Then one of the professors, both of whom are excellent improvisers, would ascend the stairs and play the organ for about half an hour, exploring all of the sight, all of the sounds and combinations while the rest of the group listened from downstairs, um, often walking around the church and exploring the church. After an initial hearing of the instrument, the organ builders would climb up into the organ and begin to examine the pipes and other parts of the organ, photographing as they went. And we organists would take turns playing and trying out the combinations of sounds 
kind of egging each other on, try this, no, let's try that. No, wait, what about this? Let's try that. By now, a couple of the partners and spouses had had enough organ and would go explore the town and search out the next great lunch or dinner place. So when, when we would show up at the lunch place and they would say, how many? And we'd say 12. They go, oh, sure, come on in. So they could get it all ready for us. <laughs> we landed in Amsterdam in the morning after leaving Seattle the previous afternoon and drove a half hour to the town of Leiden to begin seeing organs. Our first organ at the Hoglandskerk dates from 1565. There's some pipework inside the organ. We thought it was very cool that they had a poster on the back that had all of the organist's names from 1400 to oh 2000. Here's a picture of the church. <clears throat> the Peters Kerk in Leiden uh, is what the next uh, church that we went to houses an organ from around 1446 by an unknown builder. This organ is tuned in mean tone, which was the standard tuning system from 1500 to the early 1700s. I won't go into the details of this early tuning system, but if you're curious, you can chat with Bruce about that. <laughs> Um, this instrument is the only extant real Dutch city organ and the largest mean tone organ in Holland. Um, as you can see, the organ is a little difficult to, to photograph because of the chandelier hanging in front of it, but also because of the big steel work that they have added for lighting for plays and rock concerts since the organ the, the church is no longer used as a, as a church. Okay. Take a look at the center pipe. It's 24 feet tall. Uh -huh. So just to give you an idea of the size of the instrument. Mm -hmm. How did this person get there? Oh, <laughs> well, you're going to see some of that as we go along. There usually are pathways up through the walls, sometimes circular, sometimes um, difficult to transverse. But uh, um, And let me go to the next slide. The organist um, sits behind these pipes right down there. You can't see the organist per se because of the pipes. This is called the rugwer and rug means back. So the pipes at the back of the organist um, hide the organist from, from view. So the organist faces the organ. Yes, the, the organist, yeah, the organist facing the organ. Um, it would be like if at, at our organ, there would be yeah. pipes behind me. So it's right in between there. There are the keyboards. And notice that this one in the middle has a few extra notes down at the bottom to get to those huge pipes in the front, the 24 foot pipes. Um, um, the next uh, uh, slide is also a movie and it's, um, it's me playing a piece that's very chromatic, it means it has a lot of uh, uh, place on the black keys as well as the white keys. Um, and it shows this tuning system. So um, take a listen to this. Oh. And that was on not very much sleep. <laughs> so you can see the uh, the church here that would have been pews or chairs um, at one time when the organist just took uh, back this way from from the 
church and some of our group. So that is no longer a church. No, it's no, it's not not used as a church any longer. Yeah. So that's true of many of the churches, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So there's the church from outside, and um, then we finally sat down for some lunch along the canal, which was really nice. Mm -hmm. there's, I thought our first hotel was kind of cool, having a thatched roof. There's uh, Zane Boothby and Bruce uh, unloading our gear there. So uh, we traveled on to Lengo, Germany, um, and here's a picture of the church from the outside. Uh, here's that kind of moment of welcome when the organist is explaining everything to us and uh, showing us, uh, telling us about the history of the organ. There's the organ uh, in Lemgo, and this pipe is eight feet tall. We just saw one that was 24 feet tall. So this, that gives you an idea. This is called a swallow's nest organ, and it's up in the swallow's nest. <clears throat> We were fascinated by all the old uh, dates throughout buildings and things. That um, orders just show that those pipes and everything are from 1614. Wow. Sorry, I forgot the date. Yeah. And that's also was uh, Bill Porter, who was my professor at Oberlin, uh, who's and and the two professors that played for us, uh, they you know what improvising means. They don't have music and it's not something they've memorized, but they're listening to the organ and making up music as they go. And they're really amazing to to sit and to have 16 days worth of listening to that is is pretty amazing. Sure. Yes. Can you uh, speak to the how the architecture of the of the churches would reflect the sound that you hear, such as the difference between a barrel wall and a ceiling and, and something that's a little more sculpted. Um, a lot of times the organs will be up close to the ceiling and that helps to project the sound into the room. Um, all the each each acoustic is different. When we get toward the end, we'll see one of the best um, marriages of organ sound and, and acoustic. Um, but yeah, they're they're all very different. Do you want to add to that? Acoustics. Well, basically, they are all their own thing. And each marriage of organ and room is all almost has its own thing. That's partly what we go to, to listen to too, is try and learn from that how to build things that are generally less than their acoustics in the United States in terms. So uh, the other question I have. How did they power these organs? Were <laughs> they exercise? Yeah, um, the organs had uh, wedge bellows. Like think about uh, a bellows for your fireplace. They had wedge bellows, and organists had to hire pumpers to come and and pump the bellows by hand um, to play a service to practice. Um, I've got a, a, a little movie, a, a video of, of doing that uh, here shortly. Uh, but in recent years, they've added an electronic bl electric blower to to wind the organ to raise. It still gets its wind through those bellows, but they're electric blowers. Many of them still can be here. And yeah. it does sound a little different oh. when you raise the wind by hand as opposed to the blower. The blower tends to chop up the wind and throw little chunks of it into the wind line real fast. And the wind from the hand raised uh, bellows is very smooth by comparison. There's a certain calmness to it that happens with the foot pump bellows. You should probably be speaking into Sorry. a microphone for the people on the road. We drove to Corvée. Uh, you can see uh, in the distance uh, the church where we we're going, uh, Agtai Kirka in the distance. We often think of uh, centennial celebrations as being pretty great, but I want you to see what celebration they were having. There's the church when we got there. 1,200 years, 822 to 2022. <laughs> so uh, the Jubilee year, Corvée where heaven meets the earth, welcome to the heavenly city. 
So, and here's the sign pointing to the Kaiser Church that was built in 885. <laughs> so, so we were seeing some pretty old things. Pretty old things. Yeah. This organ is from 1681, has some pretty fancy um, uh, facade pipes with decorations here. I'll show you a little up close. Uh, originally, those were gold leaf, uh, but just uh, to help make make the organ look a little fancier. Jim? Uh, something like that, they build. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I really don't know. <laughs> Longer than, than probably in today's. <laughs> Yeah, a long time. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we would build an organ like that in probably six or seven thousand hours, about two years, something like that. So, yeah. so probably suspect it was similar. We had the advantage of, of power tools, but they were all they were their hand tools too. So, um, so this is in the back of the church. Uh, there's the front of the church, not from eight uh, eight the eight hundreds, but much later. Um, if you take a look uh, here at the front of the church, the old uh, part of the church is below the towers. Uh, these were added later, but this is the old part of the church um, here that's from the 800s. Here's part of our group um, as we are getting our feet on the ground for our first day of real tour. Um, and of course, lunch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We traveled on to a, uh, to a town called Tangermunda, and um, the bells greeted us as we waited for the other cars to arrive. That tower is about 300 feet tall. The organ in the church is uh, was built by Hans Scherer the Younger in 1624. Uh, it's the case is unfinished oak. There's never been any finish on the case, uh, so it's just plain old oak, but beautifully decorated and carved. <clears throat> This year, that organ is 400 years old. And the facade pipes are all original, sand cast tin facade pipes, which is really unusual in Germany because most of the tin pipes were requisitioned by the army in World War II. World War I were taken, and this church is out in the middle of nowhere, and I can find them. Some of the very few that still have its original facade pipes from 400 years ago. And notice that the case is very narrow. It's it's not very deep. So all of those pipes and wind chests and mechanisms are all in there. And once again, here's a rook positive or rook bear in front of it, and the organ that sits down in here. So what would the what would the today's pipes be made of? Steel? Lead and tin. Yeah. Lead, lead and tin, a combination of lead and tin. And Bruce. It's about 95 percent tin with the solid pipes like that. The ones now are 95 percent tin. The rest of the lead and copper and there's much man doing all kinds of stuff. So you can find already pre-made. We do some alloying of it, but some of the trace out elements we have alloyed in when we buy it. And there that's the part of the alloy that makes it strong. Lead and tin by themselves are very soft and very creepy we call um, metallurgically they, they kind of fold over on themselves over time if you don't have Dave and Mary are on the on, on the Zoom and then they could hear what you're saying. <laughs> so, oh, this is Bruce. Uh, the two people behind him, Steph Townstra is the organ professor from uh, the Netherlands, and beyond him is Fritz Elshout, who uh, is a retired uh, president of Flintrock Organ uh, Company. So, so there you can see some more of the carvings on the case. Mm, that's a, a very old reed pipe. Um, that they are examining some old front, uh, pipes from inside the organ. 
uh, more carving on the organ. A uh, picture from down below, get a sense of its size. <clears throat> uh, this is an old walled city. And uh, so these are the old walls. Uh, the Tanger Munda means the mouth of the Tanger, and it's where the Tanger River flows into the Elba. Um, and so if you look uh, here, they have markings on the wall from where it's flooded, and we know, understand that it's flooded again recently. And so the water was up on the walls. Um, but there you can see the church. I, the church was uh, hiding behind the tower in this picture, but there's the church uh, behind the tower. <clears throat> we moved on to um, Stendhal that has a Gothic organ from 1580. Um, the Gothic part is this part right here, the upper part. And then later was added this section, and then these are the pedal pipes, so those were added later. It's in very bad shape in these restoration. We did not even hear it. Um, but I thought some of the painting um, and decoration from uh, the Gothic period was uh, worth uh, taking pictures of and looking at. Um, unre completely unrestored. Uh, sing to the Lord a new song. Um, here's the Gothic art, um, altarpiece, the triptych. Uh, it was very beautiful. And also the polychrome uh, rood screen. Those are from the 1300s. Um, you can see some of the colors still in the rood screen, some reds, and there was some blues up here. Um, things. Uh, from Stendhal, we went up to uh, Stralsen on the Baltic Sea. Uh, this is the Marienkirche. Uh, some of us climbed up to the top of the dome to take a look at the city, uh, 300 and some steps. I counted them and then I realized on my ticket it said how many steps there were. <laughs> so it was right, it was correct. <laughs> yes, yes it did. So, it, actually these, these were not bad stairs compared to some of the places we used to get up into the organs. Uh, we passed the bells, we waited and hoped they would ring. We were holding our ears, but they didn't. So, and here we are um, in the top of the dome. Oh, so. There are two other large churches. So Stralsen um, had three large churches. They were all Catholic before the Reformation. Uh, this is the Nikolai Kier here, and then um, the Jacobi Kier um, also right here. So looking out for the harbor um, in Stralsen. Uh, this is the organ in the Marienkirche. Um, this is a huge room. This room's 100 feet tall. And this organ is starts at 40 feet above your head. So um, this organ is from um, Pretty Stellwagen, who uh, built this organ in 1659. Once again, the center pipe is 24 feet tall. Uh, oh, pedal pipe, sorry, these, these guys are 24 feet tall. <clears throat> That's unrestored that Bruce and I saw it in 2003. And then this is its restored. Yes. For the restoration, it must have been impossible. The, uh, the, the state, state, yeah, the state pays for restoration. So. Yeah. This one, that's the organist of the church demonstrated for us. So this organ also is tuned in that meeting tone too. It's the largest meeting tone organ in, in Germany. I have lived in Germany when I was uh, in high school for a year, and. In trips when I've gone back, I have been told by the brothers in the family that if you want to have a church wedding, you have to pay like the taxes to the to the government to pay for that restoration. Otherwise, you can't use the church. Here, standing below the organ, you can get a sense of the <laughs> <laughs> how far it is up there. <laughs> oh, did you see? Did you notice this angel on top of the case? Yeah. Yeah. Where she is up there. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. That just is looking back down the nave so you can see how large the church is. Um, this organ has 12 wedge bellows that we talked about earlier. And um, 
so we pumped the bellows while uh, the organist was playing. And so um, in, you can enjoy seeing how much fun it is. Yeah, that's safe. You need to keep a four or five bellows down all the time so it's getting here. <laughs> so, um, you're, what you're doing is when you when you step on that, you're raising the the top of the bellows, and then as the as the lever is going back up, the the bellows is coming down, and the organ is using the wind. So the other thing that we do we do too is when we step off of that, we try to step gently and with the music so that it doesn't go oh, oh you know. So that Steve, you had a question you wanted to ask about. Yeah, it's about uh, so you've got the bellows, but is there a bladder that? Uh actually regulates the flow of the air and the pipes now. Yeah. No, the bellows does it itself. It's um like she said the, the big wedge thing with the ribs and the, it's all the ladder, but it's rigid. Oh, I, I was thinking of the model of a bathroom, you know, where, where yeah, you know, the well this is it's similar because there's a weight on top of the bellows and that's what does the regulation. Oh. So okay. each bellows puts out the exact same pressure and it doesn't add up all um they they just uh, empty one after the other. So can you imagine 
hiring a couple of people off the street to come and do that so you can practice. <laughs> well, not only that, but until you find out things about how long it took to install the organs and stuff, too, because the church records list how how long they had to pay plumbers and how much. So you can tell when there was a major tubing done on the organ because they paid plumbers for a week or so. <laughs> the, the, the normally, the, the organs didn't practice on the organs, they practiced on harpsichords and things at home. So the plumbers were only paying for Sunday services. But it was a job, and there was there's an article that I'm translating now from Dutch that talks about um, them at the point that they were buying electric blowers to put on the organs, they were having to pay a stipend to the to the uh, pumpers to kind of stop severance pay. Flowers stay long ago learn their jobs. Yeah, yeah. So some of you may know Zane Boothby and this is Paul Fritz. No, and... That's Martin. Orgus. Oh, that's Martin. Sorry, that's Martin. That's, Orgus. that's Orgus. Orgus. He doesn't get to pump very often, so he was <laughs> <laughs> How do you know which one to pump? Just whichever one comes up, because well, it comes up. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. They come oh. up, and as soon as they're up, then you can push them back down. Oh, when they're yeah. up, that means that the bellows are closed, and so when you push it down, it opens the bellows, and then as the organ uses the wind, it closes again. Okay. But it has twelve of them to use, and so the organ chooses where the wind is going to come from. We don't. You, we can't just go right down the row or anything like that. Okay. So. Yeah, like little flaps up and shut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a back check valve on the bottom of the bellows. When you step on it, it sucks on it, it pulls those valves open and it sucks air out here. And then when, the, when you step off of it, those valves close again, so the air is trapped inside, gets squeezed out by the weight. Well, the green team might suggest going back to the bellows to say that. All right. This is the Nikolai Kirk. Uh, it has a uh, Kierka, it has um, an organ, uh, a later organ uh, by Carl Buchholz from 1841. So that's probably one of the latest ones we saw. But the church has Gothic uh, decoration. It's older than the Marian Kierka that where we just were. And you can see uh, there's a couple of balconies uh, for musicians there and clear down in the front. Um, but this is all Gothic um, uh, decoration. <clears throat> There are many ways to get to the organs, and there's Bruce at the top of the stairs. This is one of the nicer of the uh, stairwells up to the organs. You'll see some uh, later that go up through the walls. Um, also in the church is an astronomical clock from 1385, so it's pre-Copernicus and it's Earth-centric. So. Did all those churches become Lutheran at a certain point, or are some of them still Catholic? These three became Lutheran about 1550, something like that, up in, in the Baltic Sea. It's pretty far north, so it took a little while for it. was a big deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a big deal. It was a big deal. And this is in the third church there, the Jacobi Kirk. This is an 18th century organ case with a new organ uh, built by Christian Wegscheider in it. Um, and that's what it looked like when we were there. Uh, Bruce and I visited there in 2003 prior to the restoration, and that's what it looked like. Oh. It was very sad. Very sad. So... Um, all that all that stuff inside was lost. Yeah. So it was wow. just case, yeah. case and sign yeah. chests with all that was there. So this is a reconstruction of um, an old. Yeah. And here's a Gothic um, uh, painting ceiling on the bottom of the organ loft that oh. that was really oh. beautiful. So, hmm. We went on to Lubeck from there. Oh, let's see. Uh, did somebody have a question or a comment? Neil, did were you going to say something? No, okay. Uh, we went on to Lubeck, um, and uh, this is a beautiful organ case by Hans Scherer, the Younger, from 1624. Um, we wanted just to see this uh, case as much as anything. Uh, the finish on it is modern, but uh, the case itself is from the early 1600s. Lots of beautiful decoration. Let's see. It's the same builders that one in the under Luther, but uh, from basically a year later. And it doesn't have its original organ inside. The facade pipes and everything have all been changed. It has a modern organ from 1980 inside. Hmm. These are all original. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the one that got uh, the 18th, 19th century or the 1851 was not. Uh, that's an equal temporary organ from the 19th century. But 
virtually everything we saw either was in the zone or had been in the zone originally. And some were organs that we were just driving by. We were so close that we had to go and show some of the folks on the trip who had never been to this area too. So uh, there were a few that, that were not in tune. Um, we went to Lubeck. Um, this is the Yacobi Kirk and the organ uh, in the Yacobi Kirk um, is by Stellwagen, the same builder that built the one, the big uh, organ in uh, uh, Stralsen that we looked at. Uh, built in 1630, 1636, uh, but using parts from the 1400s. Um, Uh, this is that that was on the west wall or on the side wall, and this uh, is a big organ in the back, um, a Gothic block barrack organ built in 1465. Uh, was rebuilt and and added to over the centuries. Um, uh, Bruce worked with the Flintrop shop in 2013 um, in Lubeck uh, or in in Hamburg, and then also here in Lubeck um, as they were finishing the restoration. And uh, he voiced the 16-foot dulce on the reed stop um, on this organ that you'll get to hear now. So you, you can play on all the keys. <laughs> the times, big disadvantage is you can only play an eighth of the major keys. You can't play a twelve. So four of the keys are unuseful. Which is its downside, but the purity of the keys that you can play in more than make up for the disadvantage of not being able to play in four of the more distant keys. And Bruce is not referring to the keys on the keyboard, but the musical keys. Okay. This is a really typical picture of what I saw a lot of while we were on the trip. <laughs> Somebody says, Oh, look at this. And all the organ builders go, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so here you can see uh, where the keyboards are. Where the keyboards are and then this is the case that has the pipes behind the organist back so the front pipe you, this is the back back doors of that those cases that uh, are behind the organist so this is our whole group uh we we thought we'd take a picture real quick while everybody was uh all together there in that church <clears throat> sherry and her men yeah <laughs> somebody had to do the job what can i say <laughs> yes is it hard when you have such a, a large organ with the brand, just a large uh, sound? Is it distracting at all as a, when you play the organ? I mean, is there a delay in the keys? Or no, but when you're playing a large organ, the organist seat is probably the least good in the house because the organ sound is going up and over you. And so it's really tricky to, to get good balances between stops and sounds if you want a, a melody and an accompaniment. Um, so, but no, there's not really any delay. You can, it's it's right when you, and some of the actions are a little heavier than others and it takes a little more arm than fingers. Um, but yeah, it's it, the sound goes away from you quicker than, than if you were sitting out in the room listening to it. Yeah. Um, we went to Lubeck, and this is the Marienkirche, um, or that last one was also in Lubeck. Oh, this is the Marienkirche. Um, the church had an organ on the west wall from 1396. Uh, this was Dietrich Buxtehude's church. I played a Buxtehude chorale prelude this morning for the prelude, and uh, so I always like to go and stand by his grave and pay homage to the great composer that, that he was. <clears throat> Um, this church was, and the organ were destroyed uh, by bombing and the fires of World War II. Um, the bell, you can see there's a picture behind the, the bells 
um, of the church on fire and the bells fell and that's where they landed and the church left them there as a memorial. There's sort of a, a gate in their fence in front of them, but it's a very moving memorial to um, the destruction from uh, World War II. Uh, we left uh, Lübeck and went on to Moon. Uh, this is the Nikolai Kirk. Um, you can see the heavy duty hinges on the front doors <laughs> yeah, to get in. Um, documentation shows that there is there was the existence of an organ from 1436, uh, reconceived later uh, in 1555, extensively rebuilt in the 1600s. And this version is by Bunta um, here in the church. Electronic, they don't have your music. Um, that's the first time I've, I've put my music on my iPad, and so I carried this instead of a whole bunch of music with me. Um, and so, so old and new, <laughs> can I say? So, this is a lovely hotel where we stayed. Uh, we even went out for a walk, um, and posed by the pond. <laughs> So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, uh, we left Merle and went to Hamburg. Um, this is the uh, Katerina Kirka in the foreground here uh, in Hamburg. And this uh, behind is the Nikolai Kirk, uh, a war memorial to all that was destroyed in World War II. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture of the organ that was in this church. Um, that was uh, that was then destroyed in the war. Um, there was some knowledge that that might happen, and so they began removing pipes from the organ. And they only got about a thousand pipes out and stored somewhere else before the church was bombed. So this organ was reconstructed by the Flintrop uh, Company. Um, here's the the church. Here's the Katerina Kirka. There. Um, and we thought this was really interesting. Um, this is where the congregation worshipped after the war was over within the walls of the Katerina Kirka until it was rebuilt in the 50s and 60s. So they felt like they wanted to be in their church and so they made a, made a place for worship. Uh, so the church was rebuilt in the 50s and 60s. Um, the organ was reconstructed in... Oh, okay. This is this is where the organ was here. In, in that ditch, a little in bit. That ditch, in the yeah. one you see reconstructed is in that position now. So there's the organ that was reconstructed, and that was done a lot from the photographs and the existing about fifteen percent of the pipes that are still original that were swirled away before the church was bombed. <laughs> Um, as I said earlier, Bruce was working with the Flintrop shop here um, in 2013. They had a couple of people who had illnesses or deaths in their families, and they needed to finish the organ. And the Flintrop company called the Fritz shop and said, can you guys help us? And Bruce said, sure, I'll be right over. <laughs> <laughs> so he went and worked there for about six weeks and then went back for the dedication of the organ uh, following that. Mm -hmm. um, we know that J.S. Bach played this organ for Johann Reinken, who was the organist there. Um, Heinrich Scheidemann, I often play Scheidemann, was also the organist here. Um, so that it's really exciting to hear that music in the space and where they would have been composing music and playing it there. In a sense, it's explosive where you can get the time travel. Yes. If you go in that space, you hear Scheidemann played in the space, in the on the sounds of the organ that he composed music for, you're basically experiencing what you could have experienced 300 years, 350 years ago. Yeah. Was there? Uh -huh. um, the bigger. 
It's really hard to reach. So, yeah, there is a big disadvantage on these organs because to play the pedal, she has to bench really low, but then that means she has to reach up to the <laughs> keyboards and the music rack. So really high. Of course. See, well, yeah, it's the dynamic range of the organ right now. The four rounds plus the the pedals. Well, how are you doing? Yes. Two hundred hertz. The lowest thirty is um, the thirty two foot pipes play sixteen cycles per second, which is below here. You feel it more than you can hear. We can hear them about 20 cycles a second. Uh, and the high end of it is at the upper end, it's like 11,000 cycles. And it's like all the whole range in between. It, it's quite a feeling when you've got a full organ. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. That's really exciting. Uh, this is the church in Norden, and the famous uh, organ builder Art Schnitger built this organ in 1686. It's the second largest surviving Schnitger organ with a unique placement. It's uh, in the crossing of a cruciform church. So the choir area that's always the tallest is over here and the rest of the congregation is over here and it's right on the crossing. The pedal's here, there's some organ over here and the, here's the roof positive behind the organist's back. So it's, it's a very unusual um, place. There's, that's the choir area where you can see how high the ceiling is. <clears throat> There's the key desk with all the stops. Uh, from there, we went on to Pilsum, and, and Pilsum holds a, a dear place in my heart. Um, on my first trip to Europe to study organs in 1978, uh, Bruce and I were able to work in Pilsum for about a week uh, documenting uh, the pipe work, the old pipe work in the organ uh, for its uh, eventual restoration. Well, the restoration didn't happen until the 90s, but at least we had got the work done ahead of time. So this is the organ in Pilsum. Uh, from 1694, uh, pupil of Schnitger built that. Uh, it was restored by Jürgen Arend. Here's a picture of what it looked like in 1978. <laughs> Lots of appendages and, and goofy looking things <laughs> added to it. So anyway, but there's the key desk and the stops. <clears throat> yes? Play these organs at night. Was there adequate lighting? Yeah. Usually, some of the organs had little candle over things beside that you could light the candles, but um, but electric. electric lights. There are electric lights in the churches. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is a picture from when we uh, were documenting the pipe work. This is old pipe work, and um, <clears throat> those are all the C's, and where we measured about twenty different measurements on each pipe. Uh, here's a little wooden pipe that had come apart, and so we laid out all the pieces and measured it all up and photographed it. And, um, and uh, there we are in 1978 in, in the youth room of the church because it was the only room that was warm enough to work in. But uh, we're, we're uh, measuring pipes and uh, writing down scales and all that sort of thing. So that was my introduction to organ building in 1978. Oh, <laughs> I thought she was... Bell bombs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't forget the bell bottoms. <laughs> Believe me, that was the day, but those were the days before roller bags. We went all over yeah. Europe and carried a suitcase. But here's all the pipe work, all new, and uh, it plays beautifully. So that was a lot of fun. Um, this is the church in Uttam. 
uh, was built by an unknown, uh, the organ was built by an unknown builder in 1660. And it's about the size of our organ. It has nine stops. We've got 10. Um, it only has one keyboard and no pedal. Um, but there you can see the keyboard and the stops. Um, I, I thought this was really cool. These, these are the words of institution and they're right on the wall across from the altar. So I guess if the pastor forgets what they are, he's just gonna read off the wall. But actually it's in Plattdeutsch and Plattdeutsch is, is a combination of German and Dutch that is spoken in that area. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 yeah, yes, yes. So I thought that was that was really yeah they can all understand. No. There's there's the pulpit. but you can see that's the whole size of the room. I mean that's you know and the organs over here. So you also see the church used to be taller. Those arches went up farther, the ceiling went up farther. Some of these churches had uh, real problems with subsidence over the years, where they're sinking into the uh, ground and they shortened to take the load off, so then quit sinking. And so this has been shortened by probably I think, 20 or 25 feet of the way from the more modern roof of the uh, we went to the Arend shop, um, and this is Hendrik Arend, who is Jürgen Arend's son, uh, who is running their shop now. They've built many, many organs in the United States and Europe and all over the world. Um, this is out back. Uh, the Europeans like to keep their sawn logs together as a log so that when they make a case, it all comes from the same log and all the wood matches and things. And here are the organ builders drooling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so some more scenes from inside the organ shop. Uh, some handmade tuning cones. Um, and then we had a very special visit. This is Jurgen Arend, who's in his 90s now. He's an extremely important uh, organ restorer for the last 50 years. Um, in Europe, and he's not been well, but he lives next door, and his son called him, and he came over to greet us, and we talked to him about five minutes, and it was really wonderful. So, uh, then we went to Groningen. Uh, this is the Aker uh, in Groningen, and uh, it has a very interesting history of organs. The first organ was built in 1475, located on the south transept, rebuilt in 1558. A new organ was built on that on the spot where the organ is presently, in 1654, the, it was destroyed by fire in 1671. Um, just a minute, I lost my page here. Um, uh, in 1694, Arp Schnitker built his largest, most lavish organ in the Netherlands here. Uh, 16 years later, in 1710, the organ was destroyed when the church tower collapsed. So the church was without an organ for about 100 years. Um, and then this organ, uh, Schnitzer built for another church in 1702, and it was moved to the Aachen in 1815. So they still got their Schnitzer organ; they just had to wait a long time for it. Um, so here's a picture of Steph Townstra, who's the uh, professor from from Holland, uh, playing it. And uh, you can see how tall. Uh, once again, this is no longer used as a church. Um, so. Let's see what else is I going to say about it. Um, on Ascension Day, uh, here we had a, an event and talked about different ways that people uh, uh, celebrated and, and uh, Ascension Day. And uh, we told about uh, places in Europe where uh, they would raise a statue of Jesus up through a hole in the ceiling. Well, there it is. <laughs> there it is. And there's his feet. But here's the hole where they would raise the statue up during during the Ascension Day services, Jesus was ascending. <laughs> so anyway, I took that picture especially for you guys so you could see what we were talking about. <laughs> so where's the statue? Oh, well, it wasn't Ascension Day. It wasn't Ascension Day. <laughs> it's probably sort of a yeah, sort of a um, I let it go. Yeah, okay. I let it go. <laughs> I think I saw it. Didn't I oh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <All right. clears throat> um, we're running a little close on time, so I'll kind of zip through the rest of these, but I don't have too many more, so um, hang in there. Uh, this is La Persum, an organ built in 1562 and recently restored. Um, Steph Townster, who's the uh, organ professor from uh, Holland is also the organ advisor for many of the restorations. And this was a project that he oh. you know, took care of. I'll show you a little bit of the church.
So we get a little view of the church. This is the stairs up to the organ loft, as you can see. Uh, some of them are pretty exciting to get. <laughs> you can't carry much up there very, very easily. I often had Bruce carry the iPad. There's <laughs> no real, but at least you got a rope to hang on. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> so there's the decoration uh, around the keyboards. Uh, it's unusual uh, case decorations. We're not sure why the cow cattle heads are on the sides of the case, but anyway, um, yeah, beautiful uh, countryside as we move on to a pinganam. Uh, this is the organ in Apingadam from 1744. It contains remnants of an old sink stop by Damara that was very interesting for us to hear. Oops. Oh, let's do this. <laughs> Um, also, you can see on the keyboards, there are pegs for, through the ivory into the wooden keys below, and sometimes that worked better than some of the glues that they had to keep the ivories on top of the keys. So and that's old ivory. Um, yeah. There's the front of the church, and I'm going to show you this up close. There was a really nice um, memorial um, uh, table in the front of the church. Uh, that I thought you all would enjoy seeing. Also, there was a baptismal scroll with names of people who were just recently baptized. But here's the uh, memorial uh, table, and it had lots of nice stones with people's names on them and their dates and things. And, and a good friend of mine, her last, her maiden name is Stockles, and so I took that for her to yeah. see if she's uh, related to anybody here in, in Upingadam. Mm -hmm. And another nice lunch spot on the canal. Oh. <clears throat> We went to Zayride. Um, this organ is from 1651, and you can tell by the props that are holding the organ up that the church is having structural issues due to fracking in the Netherlands. Oh, wow. So that was very sad to see. Yeah, the keyboards there, we only went up a couple at a time. <laughs> the balcony that separated from the wall by uh, two or three inches oh, went sliding down. The props are very, very substantial, but it's not going to fall down, but they're going to have to take the whole organ part and rebuild it out. Awesome. We went on to Lanes. Uh, this organ is from 1733 by Hinch. It's his second largest organ. Uh, there you can see the keyboards up close and see the pegged keyboard similar to the previous one. That's a original. There Bruce is examining a 300-year-old uh, reed pipe. So that's the reed mechanism. Uh, that goes down into this block and then the resonators sit on top of the block and that's what makes the sound for those particular pipes. Oh, there's another stairwell. That one, that was pretty good. That wasn't as rough as some of them. Um, and there's the organ that lanes. Uh, that was a little organ up in the front of the church. There were actually four or five organs in this one small church. And this was uh, for playing with a small ensemble in the front of the church. No, they were everywhere. <laughs> uh, big organs, our big churches had more than one organ. So a lot of, that's why they can get by with having the limitations of meeting time tuning in one of their big organs. They've got another organ so they can play everything. more modern tuning system. They can play the stuff on that that won't work on the meeting time tuning. Do they keep those churches on board? No. 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 You go to church, you got to dress up more. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Mark e. Ross, the guy we saw uh, the Strauss on Company Oregon Sherry um, posted on Facebook back at Christmas time that it was uh, minus two in the, in the church. That, he's talking about centigrade, so that's, oh. that's about 28. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so then we went to uh, the city of Kroningen, uh, one of the most uh, famous uh, organs in Northern Europe. Uh, this organ is from the mid 15th century. Uh, was expanded in seven in 1479. Uh, the organ was damaged during the siege of Groningen. 
Art Schnitzer added the 32 foot pedal towers in 1691. So these parts were added to the organ. Let me go to another picture again. Okay, hold on. Um, and then this part, the rook positive, was added by his son in uh, 1730. Uh, this organ was restored by Jurgen Ahren, the old 90 year old guy that we saw in that shop um, in 1976. Uh, Steph Townstra, uh, the organ professor from the Netherlands, is one of four organs here, and he's going to play the demos. First, just the uh, front pipes, and then later, uh, the whole organ. Uh, Bruce will tell you that this is one of the, is the most marvelous marriage of organ sound and room acoustics anywhere. Uh, so take a listen. They're saying that the keyboards. Uh, during my sabbatical, one of my organ lessons was on this particular instrument. Oh, really fun. <laughs> Some of the carvings and the and the date uh, there, 1521, 1542, sorry, 1542. Here's the choir area of the church, which is quite tall as well. And there's the outside of the church. It's really a beautiful church. <clears throat> Uh, this is in Enkhausen on our way to Osthausen. Uh, it's just a really pretty scene. I thought I'd share that with you. This is the Grotekerk um, in Osthausen. Uh, we're back in Holland. Yes. Oh, we have been for a while. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> we're back in the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, here we go. Uh, this organ was built uh, around 1521, possibly by organ builder uh, Peter Baker. Um, uh, Fritz Elshout is uh, demonstrating the organ. He also is. You'll notice. I was going to say, you notice the tables and chairs in front. Yeah. What is typical is when you go to visit an organ also is sometimes they will treat you to coffee and tea and biscuits. And so they expect you to sit down and spend time there. We did. We spent, you know, sometimes three or four hours in one place. And um, so they, the, the man that was there to, to host us, I'm sure Bruce and I met him 30 years ago and he's in his 90s. And where do you see the, the ladder to the to the wow. organ. He just went zipping up there. <laughs> but here's, first of all, here's the key desk. Um, you'll notice that there are not very many keys. There are only 38 keys. Um, the bottom is um, F, G, A, B flat, B, C. Uh, we have 58 keys on our keyboard. This, so this is a very small compass, is what we say. Um, there's some pipe shades from the organ uh, beneath the pipes. And uh, that's quite a triumvirate of organ builders, uh, Paul Fritz, uh, uh, Fritz Elshout, and Bruce. So I got them all to pose there. <laughs> so 
Uh, this is inside the organ, the back of the keyboards uh, and the trackers that connect the keyboards to the pipes. Cool. And there's the, oh, there's, uh, there's the stairs. <laughs> it was almost a ladder. It was almost a ladder. That was probably the trickiest one to go up. And our final, <laughs> and our final stop, we're back in um, Amsterdam at the Nieuwekerk. Uh, this organ, uh, the transept organ, was built in 1651 by Hagebeer, and there are its keyboards. And then the big organ in the back uh, was built uh, in 1655, and the organist said, do you want to go see the big organ? We said, no, we're tired of seeing organs. <laughs> We were all pretty exhausted. The sponges were full and we yeah, could take yeah. no more in. But this was our last oh. day to see organs. And across Holland and yeah. the Netherlands, we saw many of these uh, lovely uh, windmills and enjoyed them tremendously. Um, I appreciate the time away for continuing education. This just fills my soul and just speaks to me and, and encourages me and enlightens me in many different ways. So thank you for the time off. If you've not been through, if you've not returned internationally, this is the new international arrivals at SeaTac Airport. And so that's what we came home to. So thanks for listening. <laughs>